the TRIO program at Santa Fe College. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about TRIO because I don't think a lot of you know what it is. But first, first I want to introduce Adrian. Um, as a TRIO professional, she has a track record for enhancing program outcomes through technology, including the use of video and digital learning environments. She holds a BS in education, an MA in American literature, and she's currently a PhD candidate at UF in the College of Teaching and Learning with a specialization in the history of community colleges in the United States. Um, which is very relevant because the presentation today traces the history of community colleges from the early 20th century to the modern day. And I think a lot of you may know this, but it's becoming more and more apparent that community colleges serve as a reflection of our social, political, and economic landscape of the United States. And their mission has long been a point of debate. Um, central to the issue of the debate are two conflicting ideologies, educational humanism and neoliberalism. Um, and they both shape community college policies and practices. The presentation today considers how community college leaders balance competing ideology, ideological messages. Um, and specifically, Adrian will examine the ways community colleges um, and their leaders enact policy and practices in response to different pressures. Um, we're going to talk about how these leaders uphold or adapt the competing missions of Democracy College. And we also have a second presenter today. Um, and he's going to talk after Adrian, from what I understand, and he will talk very shortly. But Bill Stevenson um, is actually the chair of the Department of Humanities and Foreign Languages at Santa Fe. And he also served as a professor of English and the English department chair. He has a BA in economics from Indiana University an MA in English from the University of Florida. And he's currently writing a dissertation to earn his PhD in higher education administration at UF. He's been mentoring um, middle school and high school students through Florida's Take Stock and Children, which many of you are familiar with. Um, and He's done that for about 15 years. So we're extremely lucky to have both of these people with us today. Now, for those of you who don't know what the TRIO program is, I just want to give you a little background. Since Adrian is the director of that program at Santa Fe. It's a federal program um, which provides educational opportunity outreach programs designed to motivate and support students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, it actually refers to three programs, um, Upward Bound, Talent Search, and Student Support Services, which, which exists because of the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Um, and it was designed to assist eligible students to begin and compete a post-secondary education. 
TRIO programs are essential educational opportunities. They're vital in promoting educational success, retention, persistence, and provide pathways to immense opportunities for low-income first-generation college students and students with disabilities from diverse backgrounds. Um, believe it or not, and Adrian can correct me if I'm wrong, the TRIO program, I think it's about 37 years old. Um, <clears throat> and it's been providing, excuse me, <clears throat> it's been providing these educational opportunities during, those during that entire time. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn the substance of the program over to Adrian. Thank you so much, Ellen. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, TRIO programs are certainly one of the most incredible aspects of um, the outreach pr program, which really started from the original Lyndon Johnson 1965 Higher Education Act and um, have been a huge part of how we're providing uh, college outreach to first-generation college students. And it's wonderful to uh, announce we just got two more of those programs at Santa Fe, making Santa Fe's total five TRIO programs. Uh, so we're really excited uh, to have that opportunity. And, and it's a wonderful job for me to be able to provide that type of programming for our first-generation low-income students. Um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, transfer over into my screen so I can start the presentation uh, with you today. Okay. Um, Bill, can you just let me know if the, the screen is showing as it should be? Great. It looks okay. great. Thank you. So first off, um, as per the introduction, I'm currently in the dissertation phase of my PhD at the University of Florida. And so a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is directly relevant to what I'm writing in my dissertation. And of course, I'm always open if um, anyone has an additional information that I should consider, um, I would be certainly open to hearing anything that would be relevant uh, to helping me continue to shape this, this as I go through. And I, I look to this opportunity to kind of have a chance to share with you things that I think are fascinating when we consider the history of the community college. Um, specifically today, I wanna to talk about how there's two competing ideologies that have really shaped the community college. And um, primarily, I think that the story is best told um, as a story with a narrative arc. And as mentioned, I, I am a, my background is in American English literature. And so I feel like everything is better told in a story format. So indulge me with that if you don't mind. Um, to begin, I wanted to mention that the impetus for this study is really taking a look at how the community college has been responsive to the political, social, and economic forces that impact higher education in the United States. So prior to my, uh, my time at the University of Florida, I was a school teacher for 20 years. I taught everything from middle school all the way through high school and even remedial um, education for adults. And in this time, I've really come to understand that education for first generation and low income students is the true pipeline for social mobility. And so when I started to think about the community colleges and the impact that they have in the United States, it's really quite staggering. So community colleges have been around for 118 years. And in that 118 years, we went from just a few small institutions to now serving over 41% of all US undergraduates in the United States. And of that percentage, the vast majority of first generation and low income, as well as students of color, start at the community college. But what troubled me when I start, started to think about those statistics was that really, despite the fact that community colleges are so integral into the higher education landscape of the United States, very little research has been dedicated to the community college, specifically research into the history and mission and purpose of the community college. 
only roughly 8% of all research and higher education journals is devoted specifically to the community college. Only 3% of community college journals are actually written um, with the community college as the main focus. And 10% of all of those meager amount of research articles are actually written by anyone who's in any way affiliated with the community college. So as a community college uh, researcher, obviously that was interesting to me. So I started to wonder why. Why is there so little attention paid to the community college and historical research? And what I did was went in a really long deep dive to look at what has been said about the community college by historians. And um, really, with few exceptions, there's four main historians who really consider the community college as a primary piece of, um, of, of research. Uh, the first was in 1962, where Frederick Rudolph made just the mere mention of a community college in the general notes section of his bibliography. And he said that these um, institutions were too recent of a phenomena to have built a historical literature which uh, it's true, the community colleges were in their early uh, stage in 1962, but uh, they had existed for 60 years prior. So it was interesting that they, they had such little uh, treatment, especially in his considerable 527 page text. Um, in 1965, Lawrence Vesey talked about community colleges, but it was a less flattering conversation. And in fact, he only mentioned it in the footnotes and out of 520 pages simply said that community colleges were so closely related to the public school system that it was questionable whether they were part of higher education in more than just a nominal sense. Fast forward to 1986 and David Levine was the first of what I'll uh, refer to as the revisionist scholars. David Levine, uh, along with some sociologists, suggested that the community college was really complicit in diverting low-income students away from the university to create a second tier of education uh, that would be almost a second class education to the elite universities. This was something that was furthered in 1992 by John Fry, who really considered the origins of the community college and the impact that the association, American Association of Junior Colleges had in trying to come up with an, a unique niche for the community college to, to have um, its, uh, its foothold in the landscape of higher education. So besides historians, the next biggest group of, of people to consider the community college history were primarily sociologists. Um, and while historians pretty much ignored the community colleges, sociologists really denigrated the community college. Uh, if we take a look at these main themes, Stephen Brent and Jerome Carabal wrote The Diverted Dream, which is by and far one of the most uh, well-read and well-recognized of these revisionist histories, where in fact they say that community college leaders, including the AAGJC, were complicit in social engineering purposely diverting students from a two-year, entering into a two-year institution away from transfer and towards vocational short-term workforce education tracks. This is a um, idea that's been repeated continually. It was furthered by Kevin Daughtery and again um, by Jade and Beck who are Beach, who were all talking about uh, this idea that the community college was a, a practice in social engineering. And um, that really hasn't gotten any better over time. What's come up most recently in the history of community colleges is a recurring idea of mission creep. So mission has always been kind of a, a, a sticky point for community colleges, because as we all know, we have a wide variety of diverse missions. In fact, the very first attempt to write the comprehensive admission um, admission statement by the association American Association of Junior Colleges came up with 22 distinct missions that would encompass the goals for a community college. So mission has always been a center of debate. What is the purpose and what is the mission of the community colleges? And while revisionists consider that mission to be diverting students' dreams, traditional historians, practitioners, and members of the community college themselves uphold the original idea of the community college as being a, 
a system of creating a democratic education for all citizenry. So this is kind of like the heart of our story. So when we go through the research, we really find two distinct historiographies. One told by the traditionalists who mainly look at the community college as a democratizing institution. And this group is primarily practitioners, the American Association for Junior Colleges, uh, original founding members, and uh, scholars who have worked within the community college system. On the other hand, the other school, if you will, are the revisionist. And while the traditional group defends, the revisionists implicate, but they all approach the history of community colleges from a functional lens that really looks to the outcomes of transfer statistics as its major data point. And um, one of the charges is that the community colleges been complicit with mission creep and that uh, over time, as we've expanded into offering four-year degrees, uh, we've gotten further and further away from our original mission. So this is the background that inspired my research and inspires our story. So I'm going to start where all good things begin, and that's at Santa Fe College. And so with this as my setting, this is where we'll dive into the story to determine what exactly was the case for the mission of the community college at Santa Fe. So my cast of characters will include um, Terry O'Banion, who was the founding lead of students at Santa Fe College. I've had the great pleasure of working with Terry O'Banion for the past two years, countless amounts of pages of transcripts. Um, Terry O'Banion himself has been a very prolific author. Uh, currently, he is working on his 19th book. He's written over 200 articles. 28 monographs, and he has five uh, awards named after him, national awards named after him. I also did a series of interviews with Benny Alligood, who was the former Associate Vice President for Educational Centers at Santa Fe College, and Tom Delano, who was a former Dean of Research and Planning at Santa Fe College. And beyond that, I also had a silent narrator, and my silent narrator, uh, pun intended, was the archive, if you will, that exists at Santa Fe. And in this sense, our archive was really a closet of um, remaining books and pieces that were historically kept. But what's so remarkable is this was truly a gift because one of the things historians point to for the lack of community college histories is that there was a lack of archival documentation. And so having this archive, albeit small, is really quite unique when considering what other historians have had to look at the history of a community college over time. I also would like to make sure that I point to three specific terms that will be relevant as we go through the story. The first is humanistic education. Humanistic education was the defining ideology that emerged in the 1960s during the community college movement. And humanistic education is defined as a commitment to education and practice in which the teaching and learning process emphasizes individual freedom, value, dignity, and integrity. Now, recently, education has been um, implicated for being a partner in neoliberalism. And in this case, neoliberalism in education is defined as uh, creating a purpose of education in terms of investment uh, made in the development to create or produce human capital. What students should learn and value in education is only relevant to what they may potentially earn. And the final definition I'll refer to is innovation. And I'm gonna use the definition I quite like, which says innovation resembles mutation, the biological process that keeps species evolving so they can compete for survival. And uh, innovation will be particularly important as we consider the interplay and in ideologies between humanistic education and neoliberalism in this story. So I'm gonna start uh, kind of at the beginning. And even though Santa Fe opened in 1965, the real story really started in 1958. And the reason it started in 1958 was that was the year that the National Defense Education Act passed into law Title V. And the purpose of Title V was specifically to train counselors and advisors. And one of the universities to receive Title V funding was the University of Florida. This is incredibly important because our main characters, uh, which would be Dr. Terry O'Banion and the founding president of our college, Dr. Fordyce, 
got their education through and at the University of Florida and were greatly impacted by Title V's programming. And even though Title V from the National Defense Education Act was really supposed to help uh, counselors move talented students into the STEM or science area, what really happened is they were highly influenced by the third uh, force in psychology, uh, humanistic education, which sprang from a uh, Maslow and Young and Arthur Combs, who was uh, a head at the University of Florida's um, College of Education at the time. So with this background in humanistic education, Fordyce and O'Banion opened Santa Fe College with a commitment. And at the center of the commitment was humanistic education. The student would be the center of the, of the learning process. The student would be um, in control of their own learning and that we really believed experimentation and creativity was important in education. Fordyce and O'Banion created this commitment and it actually became a code that they would use to test any aspiring Santa Fe faculty or staff. So during the interview process, they would go through the tenets of humanistic education to see how closely the faculty member bought in to what uh, humanistic education stood for. And those tenets became part of the Santa Fe College mission statement. It existed in the front page of the purposes and programs for the Santa Fe um, um, catalog for, for countless years. And if you take a close look at it, you'll see that there's really no mention of academic outcomes specifically, but rather it's more geared towards whole student development, self-actualization and promotion of uh, what we would consider to be the non-cognitive skills. Humanistic education was also deeply connected to counseling and student advising. And in fact, at this time at Santa Fe College, all students were required to take a class that was called BE 100. And BE 100 was about how the individual functioned in a changing environment. And that class was taught exclusively by counselors here at Santa Fe who were graduates from the University of Florida's Title V program, all of which had a huge background in humanistic education. So what happened was students were recognizing the need to connect their coursework to what they wanted for their future lives. And we know from the research that that in fact is what's necessary for students to be able to stay the course in college. Nothing's more closely related to helping student persistence than making those connections. And that's what BE 100 did. In addition, the very function of the, the housing here at Santa Fe, not the housing, but the, the classrooms themselves and the setup and construction were all humanistic in, in nature. If you've ever come to Santa Fe, you'll notice that we don't have large classrooms. There's no um, auditorium seating for the most part here at Santa Fe, and that was done intentionally. Humanistic education wanted to have integration. Uh, so in the center of each one of Santa Fe's main halls, you'll find a sunken meeting place. And that's because advisors and faculty members and counselors and students would all meet together after class in this meeting space to share ideas, to swap ideas. Um, you'll also notice at Santa Fe, we have houses which were part of into purposely integrated units. We weren't divided by specific discipline at Santa Fe because Fort Oyster and O'Banion were purposeful in making sure that everything was an integration of shared ideas and that no one field or specialty would have complete ownership of the learning experience for students. Um, and the final part of humanistic education that Fordyce and O'Banion championed in the early years was a really unique grading system. So in the beginning at Santa Fe, you could only earn an A, B, C or what they called the X grade. You can never earn a D or an F. And the X grade allowed students to not be successful in the classes, but they wouldn't be penalized. They would simply repeat the course again until they were able to pass the course. It was definitely part of humanistic education that grading was an arbitrary metric that was set on students to create a deficit framework. And so the ABC grade uh, was something that, ABC X grade was something that would ensure that the students would find success. So that 
is how our story begins. But when we reach the conflict of the story, we're gonna meet some interesting pushback. I argue that the pushback against humanistic education had very little to do with the institution themselves, unlike the idea that we've actually experienced mission creep. I would contend that our mission expansion has been due to outside or external, external forces. Primarily here at Santa Fe, those forces have been from the University of Florida and from federal government legislation. So we'll start with University of Florida. So uh, UF did not at first recognize the value of Santa Fe. In fact, it became well known in um, the local community that we were called Santa Play instead of Santa Fe because they thought our grading policy and all of our humanistic education pieces uh, were not rigorous enough. And as, as Delano explained to us, the University of Florida really went nuts over these X grade transcripts. And in 1977, the registrar drew a hard line at Santa Fe and said, either you get rid of that X grade and create a normal grading process and system, or we're no longer going to uh, take any of your students. We're gonna convert all those X grades to Fs. So by 1977, uh, Santa Fe had to trade change its grading policy because of course our relationship with the University of Florida was central to the reason why many of the students wanted to attend Santa Fe and for our students' success. A second issue that we had was the BE100 class that was taught by all of our counselors um, was not translatable to other community college systems. And the legislation moved to common course alignment to ensure that students would be able to matriculate from a two-year institution to a university. And because BE100 wasn't a common course across all institutions, it had to be phased out of the system. Societal forces really also started to take play. The 1960s was a time of idealism and activism. It was part of a, a movement, a social movement. But by the late 1970s, economic recession really started to cause a lot of people in society to doubt the incredible amount of money that was being spent in uh, higher education. And specifically humanistic education started to fall out of favor with the academy because it wasn't measurable or testable. And so accountability started to be really a metric of assessment. If we're going to provide funding, we need to make sure that these institutions are doing a good job. But humanistic education was very difficult to define. Um, and so some of the leaders like uh, Arthur Combs were, were implicated as uh, really having um, a lack or a lack of defined outcome and that the, the goals that we had were not measurable or accessible. And then the final piece of the puzzle that occurred in the 1970s was an overall need for increasing documentation related to that funding. And uh, as one VP said, the overall system of reporting had gotten so burdensome that uh, they had to create over 161 different recurring reports for state and federal agencies. So what that meant was the time that student affairs or counselors and advisors had been able to devote to students was now being monopolized by reports and documentations for state and federal reporting agencies. But the final blow to the humanistic education movement at Santa Fe was in 1970 when they launched the computerized academic advisement system in 1978. The college stated that the reason for this development was, was purely economic. They didn't have enough funds to be able to support the number of advisors and counselors needed with the huge influx of students that had come into the community college system. But because Dr. O'Banion and Fordyce's central hallmark was that advising and, and that humanistic approach it completely changed the entire environment of the community college. And uh, we really reached the climax of our story in 1980. Um, and we, that's where neoliberalism began uh, a term that was, was being pointed to. Um, economists started to measure education as a value calculated in the production of human capital. And so the idea was, uh, 
you really needed to be able to measure what was happening in higher education, and you needed to be able to equate that to future earnings. In addition, uh, social interest in, in higher education was rising. I don't know if you'll remember, but Newsweek had a, an article that was very popular. It came out, Why Johnny Can't Write. And that was a phenomena that really kind of got going and it was only taken up again with a nation at risk. And higher education kind of came in the crosshairs um, after Why Johnny Can't Write was another uh, publication that said Johnny can't write because his English teacher can't either. And so kind of a war on higher education and a war on teaching as a profession ensued. And accountability, assessment, and credentialing became the central focus of education. And it's important to note that performance funding at the community college demonstrated assessment metrics uh, did not show to have any increase over time. But because that was what the college was measured on, that's how the college had to shift. And there's no better place to see this change and mission shift than if we look specifically at the changes to the mission statement. So as you'll see, the mission statement changed at Santa Fe five times. So the original founding mission of humanistic education that I shared in an earlier slide uh, ran from 1966 until 1979, virtually unchanged, almost word for word. Um, in 1979, however, that's when SACS accreditation, uh, what, we were under the accrediting process and the, the accreditation committee said that the mission was really too difficult to assess. And so they made a recommendation for changing the mission statement at that time. And in 1979, that was the first time the mission statement was changed and the addition of um, the original mission happened there specifically to state what type of degrees would be awarded. In 1982, the entire mission statement adopted exactly what the SACS accrediting team recommended, something that could be assessed. In 1992, uh, we revised the mission statement again, but it included 10 goals and commitments to the community. And then 1998, those goals were removed again, kind of recrafting or going back to the original SACS accreditation statement that was written in 1992. So when we overlap these changes of missions with the history of what was happening at the time, you can see when we went into the economic recession of the late 1970s, the implication to college missions is almost palpable. You can almost put your finger on the year that it happened. So the SACS accreditation team really took aim at the humanistic mission. They said that the humanistic mission was, and I quote, too difficult to apply, and that the phrases offered a full spectrum of interpretation. Um, that were impossible to assess and that it didn't reflect any of the state mandates or legislation that was um, a responsibility of the college. So the SACS team suggested that they revise the statement in a way that better outlined the college's current purposes in line with state mandates and that the previous statements of purpose and the increasing demands of society for accountability and education be reflected. And that's when the mission statement changed in 1982. In addition to that change, uh, student affairs, uh, the counseling and advising section had always taken place immediately following the purpose or mission of the college. Uh, as an example, you can see in 1968, the student affairs section of the uh, course catalog occurred on page six, immediately following the purpose and mission statement. By 1985, the counseling and student affairs section of the, of the catalog had been relegated to page 36. So again, once, once again, we can see a palpable change in the ideology and mission of the community college. And we can see that through the discourses of our institution. So now for the denouement. So when we look at the outside forces, it really shows what has occurred in our mission at the community college was not a decision as it's been implicated by internal forces. It wasn't a result of our desire to secure a foothold in higher education. 
it wasn't the goal of uh, community college presidents to try to gain any status. Uh, but in fact, it isn't mission creep that happened. It was pressures from outside institutions and legislation, legislative pressures. Pressure from the University of Florida changed our programming. It changed our grading policies. Increased federal and state le legislation took away the ability and time that our student affairs professionals had to spend counseling and advising students. Lower economic support took away funding that supported a lot of the one-on-one -on -one and student-centered instruction programming and support systems. And overall, a rise in neoliberal ideology displaced humanism for the sake of assessment. I would argue though, that there's room for our historiography to consider an additional perspective. So as I think about the story of accreditation, I think about what happened in the shift of the mission statement. So educational humanism was our original founding mission statement in 1965, but that mission statement was written for students. By the time we changed the mission statement in 1982, and it reflected neoliberal discourse. It wasn't written for students anymore. It was written for college stakeholders and SACS accreditation committee. So what happened to humanism? Did it leave the mission altogether or did it actually just go somewhere else? Again, if we look at counseling and advising, educational humanism was at the center 1965 of our advising led counseling program. In, in neoliberal times in the 19, late 1970s during the recession, prof, paraprofessionals and computer systems were replacing certified counselors. But did we abandon advising altogether or do we just need to look in a different place? When we think about the expansion of programming for vocational program, which has long been um, the, the, the programming that the revisionist narrative points to to say that we are diverting students' aspirations. Uh, general education was a huge movement in the 1960s. And during the, the, the 1960s and 70s, educational humanism was, was really a part of the general education movement. But in the 1970s, as uh, economic recession hit, people, uh, society, and students too, were really looking for quick degrees that aligned with workforce needs in order to get a job. But did that mean that humanistic disappeared from all of our program? Where do we need to look to see where did the humanism go in our institution? And so I'm looking for clues to say that there's a sequel to this story, one that hasn't been told, an alternate ending, if you will. And for the purposes of my study, I think that we've got the traditional history um, we're, we're really relying on um, kind of writings from the AAJC, and we've got the revisionist history, which has basically been created by sociologists, and, and they created the idea that the community college was a sorting mechanism. But I believe, as did Foucault, that the historian's role is not with the impossible task of writing the true historiography or a revisionist goal of being able to write a truer history, but rather it's the goal of the historian to uncover the processes that established these dichotomies in the first place. Conflict theorists would say that um, unequal groups usually have conflicting values and agendas, and that causes them to complete, compete against each other. And this constant competition between groups forms the basis for the ever-changing nature of society but that history actually lies somewhere in the middle of these two binary stories. My research is now uh, going into a, a historical discourse analysis approach. And I believe that if we look at the, the, the gap, as, um, as Foucault would say, the history is in the gaps. If we look to the gap, that's where we'll find where humanistic edu ed education appeared. And I believe that that gap is in the innovation of the community college. Santa Fe College has been a force of innovation. And so we get to recognize that 
uh, we're always at the cutting edge of innovation in the community college. And while the mission changed, uh, the mission statement changed, our mission stayed intact. It just appears uncovered in the traditional narrative, but exists in the innovation of our faculty members, our staff, and our college as a whole. So as we're reaching this resolution of our story, all of us get to decide how our story is going to end. These are unprecedented times. We're living in COVID-19 and we're facing another economic crisis and uh, change is inevitable and it, it's already happening. Neoliberal policies don't have to shape us. They don't have to define us. And I would suggest at this time, like none other, it's important to consider humanistic foundation that our institutions were built on. Because where neoliberal education fails is in its inability to qualify the very outcomes that many of our students enter our institutions to achieve. And that leaves a question for us all. How will we change the sequel to this story? How will Santa Fe add back the humanistic policies and practices that we're, we're founded upon? And I believe that not only are we doing that now, but with a close look at the innovations of our college and the innovations of the community college as a whole, I would argue that we've never stopped doing it. And I'm going to pause briefly uh, to invite Bill to, to follow up on some of those innovations that are occurring even now within our institution. Thanks, Adrienne. Um, I, I, I took the challenge, really, that, um, that Adrienne offered here. Um, to, uh, to look really at the history of Santa Fe, the history of Santa Fe's services and um, recent developments in terms of our services, uh, as well as analyzing a little discourse. I'm, I'm looking at a contrast between uh, our previous strategic plan and the one that we just created for the next three years. Um, and by the way, I welcome Barbara Overlander who is here to chime in at any time because uh, her, her marvelous career at Santa Fe was even longer than, than, than my uh, 22 years, I think, so far. Um, so there's always been this necessary tension between vocational human capital imperatives uh, reflected in the neoliberal discourse and the democratizing whole person self-realization imperative of a more humanist discourse uh, in the as Adrian pointed out, more than a century old development of the two-year college in the United States. Uh, one really critical uh, essay in, the, uh, in um, thinking about the history of the community college is a 1993 essay uh, by James Ratcliffe called Seven Streams in the Historical Development of the Modern Community College. And he notes that the 1914 philosophy statement of the Oklahoma Institute of Technology, which is now Northern Oklahoma College, uh, and that college combined a liberal arts and an explicitly industrial curricula. Um, the, this, this philosophy said, democracy is no new ideal for this country. Quite true, but we are coming to a larger social vision and a larger interpretation of democracy. We've long proclaimed the equality of our citizens but we're coming to see that equality must mean equal opportunity for self-realization, recognition of individual differences. That's 1914. Um, Santa Fe was founded midway through this tradition um, in 1965, and it's always engaged in the longstanding effort to resolve these tensions, or perhaps better to maintain them in a, in a productive and creative dynamic. Um, there's, this has been a challenging uh, effort, uh, especially over the last uh, 30 or so years, as Adrian's uh, suggested, indicated, um, described quite explicitly, um, as there's been this effort to measure and assess everything about higher education. You all, many of you are familiar with the, the impact and the stresses that may come from that, um, because that effort to measure everything can kind of threaten the legitimacy of aspects of college education that are the most intangible and, and in some ways we might argue the most vital. So, uh, and I, I'm glad I'm doing this because I was reminded by Alan that, that many of you probably aren't familiar, very familiar with Santa Fe College, um, that I wanna talk about uh, how Santa Fe services have been dedicated to the self-actualization of its students, to their 
freedom, value, dignity, and integrity, as Adrian uh, quoted in her definition of, um, of humanist orientation education. So, you know, these uh, elements of the whole student beyond and above their employment potential. Um, and, as, and as also Ellen's pointed out, um, Adrian herself is a critical player in this effort. He's the director of our TRIO programs, which support and cultivate students from at risk backgrounds in their college aspirations from middle school through college graduation. Interestingly, um, the TRIO programs emerged at exactly the same time as Santa Fe College. So we're con co co uh, contemporaneous. Um, uh, we have, and I'm gonna mention a lot of services that are very typical um, in many ways at a university or a four-year college, but they're quite rare actually at a community college. Um, the first one I wanna mention is Santa Fe's Counseling Center. Uh, we've had one for 30 years, at least 30 years. Uh, and again, not all uncommon for universities, uh, comprehensive universities, um, but of the 28 Florida colleges, community colleges, uh, only eight have counseling centers at all, and only six are uh, independent entities like ours, which provide the kind of professional services ours does. Just six years ago, as a matter of fact, Santa Fe committed to the full professionalization of its staff as licensed mental health providers providing confidential mental health services. Uh, other relatively long-standing services We've had a police station since 1993 to look after students' physical safety. Uh, we have, uh, for many years, had a disabilities resource center to make sure that uh, all students, no, no matter what their different abilities, get supported in their uh, pursuit of a college degree. Uh, we have a little school that provides childcare, though, in, in fact, mostly to um, faculty and staff. Um, we have veteran services programs for the special experiences and needs of our veterans. And for the last several years, we've had a program called My Brother's Keeper, which is a leadership program for black male students that's really flourishing. But it, within the last five years, there have been a number of new developments on this front. We now have a student health center to look after students' physical well being, a spectrum of success program within our disabilities research, uh, resources center that's a wraparound program for students on the autism spectrum, which it's probably unprecedented actually at community colleges and not just a rare birth, a, a rarity. Um, we have St. Shareware and a food pantry to provide low cost clothing to faculty and uh, others on campus, as well as a, a, a pantry, food pantry for free food. Interestingly, uh, our college ombudsperson, and you think of a college ombudsperson as someone who uh, resolves conflicts. Um, but much of her orientation has been for many years toward connecting students with uh, support services at the um, college and in the community when they face a variety of challenges. And over the last few years, she's taken on a special mission to identify and support our homeless students, of which there are not a small number. Um, we have an international center to support the needs, especially for guidance and acculturation of our uh, international students, of which we have several hundred. Um, and most recently, we've had an LGBTQIA center uh, approved, uh, though not um, completed, um, uh, which um, happened largely as a result of collaboration between student government and our access and inclusion and task force. To supplement the childcare uh, opportunities at the little school, we've recently got a C Campus grant, which provides support for childcare for low income students in their own neighborhoods, uh, particularly on the east side of Gainesville. Uh, and we have a life happen. This was like one of the things I thought was coolest uh, that happened um, recently is we now have a life happens grant um, through student fairs. That's an emergency aid grant, which I don't think we ever had before in the history of the college that can help students with anything from, you know, buying books when they have a sudden shortfall of income to paying their rent for a month to, to um, uh, you know, car repair, that kind of thing. And that's happily been enormously supplemented by CARES Act funding from the federal government during the pandemic. Um, two final efforts to transform the college's support for our students um, with all of their, um, the variety of backgrounds and needs. 
um, we've dissolved our college prep area and taken all of those courses and put them into academic departments. Uh, my own department, for instance, has taken our English for Academic Purposes um, program and those courses and um, serving those students. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, and this really reflects, it was just a few years ago, I can't remember the exact date, Adrian, you may remember, when um, Santa Fe announced a marriage between um, student services and academic affairs, between uh, a metaphorical marriage between the provost and the vice president of student affairs. But a major thing that's really come out of that idea of combining those areas is learning commons, which now occupies half of the space of the Santa Fe Library, expands and consolidates all of our tutoring, which had formerly been uh, in academic foundations, that is our college prep, former college prep area, and adds academic coaching, which assists all students, not just students who are seen as having some sort of a deficit, um, so whatever their educational background, whatever their particular talents or challenges, we want to help them develop a growth mindset uh, to be able to learn from failure and to become more effective at studying all of their, um, uh, all of their uh, coursework. Um, and then I looked briefly at uh, the differences. I just wanted to see if there was, were any differences in terms of the discourse between our old strategic plan, which was very uh, uh, effective, obviously. Uh, uh, many of these new services arose as a, as a result or as a response to that plan. Um, but we have a new three-year strategic plan. And uh, I wanted to see, you know, was there any shift in neoliberal and humanist discourse uh, in the way that um, Adrian had laid, has laid out for us? Um, the last one had pillars of access, connection, direction, and achievement. It was supposed to go from 2014 to 2019, but was extended um, through the transition from President Sasser to President Brody. Um, the new one, interestingly enough, and you may already hear a difference, is organized by the categories of clear purpose, equitable experience, growth mindset, and seamless transition. Um, uh, and I was really surprised that I found such stark differences in language. Uh, the previous prep plan is a lot more transactional uh, with operational and outcome goals uppermost. Um, there's an emphasis on growing and improving the college, obviously successful, but the new plan is much more focused on providing students with what they need and cultivating their potential, whatever they bring to the college, whatever their particular goals in life may be. Here's just a few examples. The previous plan, we committed to make it easier to do business with Santa Fe assess quality and cost effectiveness of services, communicate in terms clear to students and map out pathways to resources. Contrast that with a commitment to ignite and reinforce a love of learning, cultivate collaboration, collaborative problem solving, make connections to lived experiences and eliminate barriers to participation and achievement. Um, the previous plan, said that we would serve students at the point of contact. Our new plan, when our new plan will promote a culture that meets students where they are and inspires them to thrive. Uh, in terms of college community relations, our previous plan, uh, we were to communicate Santa Fe's value and strengthen networks and connections to the public. In the new plan, we're gonna build strong partnership and with community organizations offering services for basic needs. Um, so I could give you a whole bunch more examples, but I think you can hear uh, the differences. Um, one, another one I just noticed is, is sort of in an orientation towards students. And in the previous plan, uh, we committed to model and instill professionalism, but the new plan, we're gonna promote health, wellness, and wholeness for the first time, health, wellness, and wholeness for the first time that I can remember explicitly being a goal for the college in all of the 20 plus years that I've been here. Again, Barbara may, may know the time uh, prior to mine when, when we use language like that. So, I mean, I've obviously cherry picked to emphasize the contrast, but the language is truly different overall. And so I, I just was encouraged to find that um, uh, there's happy news on the front and, uh, in terms of the questions that Adrian um, was raising 
about the future direction of Santa Fe College. So I, that was what I had to, to, to present. Um, and um, I know we'll both be delighted to take any uh, questions that you might have. You know, I'll add one more thing before we take questions. You know, Santa Fe will always, must always serve the employment needs of students in the community. Um, you know, we've built a you know, bunch of new facilities for our uh, technical programs recently. Um, that part of us is still vital. It's built into our DNA. Um, but I think it's important for all of us to remember that our relationships with students should never be instrumental merely about building human capital. We're serving whole students at Santa Fe and more and more the services we provide, I think, and the language you use to guide our future activities are reflecting that critical understanding. Thanks. Okay, Ellen, if you wanna unmute yourself, um, you wanna make any comments before we go to questions? Um, I have no comments to make. Um, I mean, I think Santa Fe is a reflection of what's going on generally across the United States with more and more potential students seeking a community college education before they decide on whether or not they're going to go to um, school to finish their degree. Of course, you can get a BA currently at Santa Fe, um, but a lot of students want to go to a four-year college to finish their education. The community college itself serves just as an incredible, viable opportunity for students to test their skills, see how far they can go, and also get educational and financial support um, for, for the courses they want to take. Um, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, of Santa Fe, as both Bill and Adrian know. And I just think they do a tremendous job with their students. And, you know, our scholarship fund um, has actually um, ended up Students have actually ended up using a lot of those scholarships to go on to UF or to finish their degrees at Santa Fe. Um, so among us, it has an incredible reputation. I think it has an incredible reputation in the greater um, community, um, very far reaching. But it's, it's not unique. I mean, there are other outstanding community colleges, both in Florida and across the country. And I think all of what Adrian and Bill um, talked about is um, applicable in some sense to those colleges also. You want me to go ahead and go to questions? We have several hands up. Thanks for that high praise, Ellen. We certainly appreciate it. Go ahead, Barbara Oberlander. Adrian and Bill, thank you so much. Adrian, that was fascinating. It really was to hear that. Um, yes, I came to Santa Fe as an adjunct faculty member in 1972. Mm. I became full-time in 1975 and I retired happily <laughs> 30 years later. I saw tremendous changes at the college. But one of the things I want to emphasize is faculty, faculty, faculty. We were so conscious of the fact that we were doing something unique, experimental, creative, exciting. There was a commitment among the faculty to reach students who could not be reached before, to help students uh, develop as learners to ease the transition of the Vietnam vets who flooded our classes in the 1970s, really. And I think all of us shared that. And so in your story, 
you really need to put the faculty front and center. We were supported by all the wonderful um, mechanisms that there were for students who came with poor backgrounds or were first time college students, but it is the excitement and commitment and creativity of the Santa Fe faculty, I think that really is part of their success story. Of course, I'm a little bit prejudiced, but <laughs> that's where I am. Uh, and that's where I'm hoping to look is to those innovative and creative practices. In fact, that's the whole part of the, the dissertation that I, I, I'm, I'm crafting now is that you know, the traditional sense has been looking at this discourse that's really for an outward facing audience, but nobody has looked at the inner innovation and creativity, which is what my dissertation will explore. Um, so that's exactly where I'm going. So thank you for that comment. Yeah, I have to say um, that those pressures, right? Um, those pressures to think mostly in terms of outcomes and assessment. Um, and I, I don't know how you felt about this uh, while you were here, Barbara, but I, I did feel like when I got here in 1997, we were more at a place where, you know, some of my colleagues and even myself were, saw ourselves as having more of a gatekeeping function, more of a function um, that was, you know, expect more uh, from a university. And, Really, over the last few years, um, I've, I've been noticing and I've been encouraging my faculty uh, more of an effort to, to see ourselves as supporting students to fulfill their potential. Um, and during the pandemic, especially, I've been astonished, I'm truly, truly astonished at how committed faculty, new faculty, old faculty, full-time faculty, part-time faculty have been to, to continuously reaching out to students, to, uh, you know, especially those who kind of disappeared, to find out what's going on with them, to find out whether there are ways that the college can support them uh, and to get them back into the class and help them stay on the path. And that feels frankly different than the way things felt when I first started here as a faculty member. So I think those shifts are, are, are being felt, the shifts in, in priorities get felt and they, they come out in the classroom, they come out in the our orientation of students as well, for good and for, for sometimes for ill. Thank you. Shirley, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. This is a great, great way to look at uh, the community college. And I think Barbara is right. The faculty was so instrumental. I've been in Gainesville a long time and it was always known that the university was a weeder outer system mm -hmm. and the Santa Fe was a helper for education system. So it was always known that it had a humanistic approach to it. But in 2004, I was invited to help start a prime time institute. The college mm -hmm. thought a community college should reach out to yeah. the seniors. And we ran it for five years to 2009. Of course, it brought in some income, very little, but it was hugely successful. And when they notified me that they would no longer fund it, I thought we were going to have a geriatric violent protest. <laughs> they, they, they wanted to meet with the president. They thought, no way are you going to stop these programs for us. We need education too. We're part of this community. If you're a community college, include us. And it was nice to have seniors on the campus with with young people, it was intergenerational in a very nice way. Uh, but after the uprising by the geriatric <laughs> population, <laughs> it just so happened that the senior center was opening up and it is now a very successful program run by volunteers at the senior center, but there's no intergenerational feel to that. So there's something missing in the humanist approach <laughs> to that, but we were happy. I was happy that the old birds should leave the nest and let the young people have the education during funding times that were a problem. So, congratulations on moving forward, you guys. It's great. And I know what a great program that is. I've, I've heard about it. Um, I, I, I will say, uh, because I've, I've had so many conversations with uh, residents of Village right across the street from us, 
that a couple of years ago, I actually recommended that to the provost that we might consider having a classroom or <laughs> classrooms actually at the village that would have where folks there obviously could take the classes without going across the street and our own students of right. various ages would, would be taking the classes with them. Um, so that's super complicated, uh, would be complicated under Very pandemic complicated. conditions and those concerns. But at that time, there were just too many logistical concerns and legal concerns. I know uh, that things that are very, very hard to overcome. But yeah. we did. We related to the village very well. We actually had bocce competitions, the primetime group <laughs> and the village group, right? So it was interesting. Yeah. Thanks for doing it, guys. Thank you. Rick Gold, go ahead. Yeah, I really appreciate these fabulous like, complimentary presentations just truly fascinating um, as a strategic planner i'm always interested in uh, what is the real mission that is unstated rather than the one that's on paper uh, but i also am concerned that strategic plans uh, end up on the shelf and nobody knows what they're about uh, has there been any efforts to try to impart these values and objectives to faculty and staff. Adrian, do you want to talk about that and then I'll follow up? Well, I was just thinking about the QEP. Um, so our, our college comes together um, and looking at a plan for revision and we're currently in the QEP process now. Um, is it quality enhancement plan? Is that what yes. it is? Yes, yes. Yeah. And so we are all brought to the table, anyone with an idea. In fact, um, I'm on a crusade to bring back a required mandatory freshman experience course um, because I think it's central to what the research tells us about helping students orient, especially um, first generation low income students. But that's a story for a different time. But in answer to your question, yes, I think I think the college does work hard to integrate the overarching goals and plans and mission of the college, um, you know, with the with the staff members and faculty. Uh, Bill, your thoughts? Yeah, we've made. Uh, I, no, I agree with you. I believe me. I have been involved in projects over my years at Santa Fe that people spent many many hours on and created a lot of documents about, and then ended up on a shelf. I mean, that does happen. Uh, I will say with this last strategic plan, especially, um, my immediate supervisor, uh, our Assistant Vice President for Liberal Arts and Sciences, Stephanie Washell, um, she's very invested in thoughtfully facilitating planning in all of our academic departments. And so I know I've had um, more than one retreat to develop plans of our own for our departments and other departments have done the same time. And one of the things that we always look at and think through as we're figuring out uh, goals and activities for our, you know, uh, in, in, my, in our departments are the strategic plan itself. What can we do to contribute to actualizing and realizing that plan? And I know that's going to continue at least in liberal arts and sciences, I'm assuming it happens on the career and technical education side of the house as well. So uh, at least for now, um, you know, for the last several years, uh, the strategic plan has been a serious part uh, of uh, our own planning at unit levels. Thank you. We have two more questions, if you can hang in there with us. Um, Anne-Marie, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I really appreciate your presentation because um, I think it's a unique opportunity for me to understand how you've um, tracked changes in mission and, uh, and organization structures over time in one organization. And uh, in my previous career teaching, I wouldn't have seen that. Um, and I'm interested in whether or not, and this is just for me, not for your dissertation or for your dissertation committee necessarily, but I'm interested in whether or not you've uncovered um, other examples out there in the United States or maybe even Canada of um, institutions that have gone through a similar 
um, trajectory because it seems to me that, you know, especially in the 60s when, um, when Santa Fe was founded, Miami Dade wasn't long after that. And they had much the same kinds of issues that they were facing over time. FIU, which of course was, I think, a senior institution um, in the late 60s and early 70s, was into um, humanism and uh, interact interactive and experiential learning. And it had a much more um, pleasing mission in those days when I taught there in the early 70s uh, than it did 10 years later. So I'm just wondering if there are any other examples out there to look at um, that um, might help someone like me understand um, you know, what, what to look for. Absolutely. Um, so my dissertation specifically will follow the writings and career of Dr. Terry O'Banion. I don't know if anyone knows Dr. O'Banion, but he was um, the president for the League of Innovation in the Community College for 32 years. He, um, he consulted on a thousand different uh, community colleges campuses in the United States and in Canada. Uh, he has five national awards named in his honor for community college service. He was the founding dean at Santa Fe. He was the dean at the College of Central Florida. So to, to answer what you're asking, my hope is that I didn't, I looked at Santa Fe for a paper that I wrote and it kind of got my wondering started for this work, but I didn't want to generalize. So I chose Dr. O'Brien because for one, he's prolific. I mean, he's writing his 19th book at um, 87 and he's, I, I mean, his resume takes up so much space, it's very intimidating. <laughs> but um, I figure if I'm able to trace how he has navigated this shift to neoliberalism through his career and his work, that that would be more generally representational of the community college system as a whole. Because as the president of the League of Innovation in the community college, of course, he has him that imprint on all of the leading community colleges across the nation. Um, you know, as well as the, the imprint on some Aspen award winning community colleges. So I, I wanted to try to stay away from doing a institutional history because there's a bazillion of them. And mm -hmm. I wanted to try to find something that would be a bit of a different, a more nuanced approach. And um, for me, it's innovation. And that's where Dr. O'Banion, I think, can give me so much information that would answer your question because I think it's mm -hmm. in innovations of the community college system that humanism went to, like that, that's where we shifted. And so my hope is that when we look at the innovations of the community college system, we'll see humanistic education, just like we were taught, what uh, Bill was just talking about with Santa Fe, every way that we've innovated has brought forward kind of those humanistic goals, especially, I mean, I think education is kind of a, a pendulum, just like politics, right? So, um, you know, we, we had this radical swing uh, from Lyndon Johnson all the way to Reagan, and then, um, you know, a shift and now we're shifting again. And I think education has that same swing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, um, but at least with, um, with looking at innovation as being the hallmark, I feel like that's where humanism lives. There were two great, um, Bruce Campbell wrote an incredible um, essay about tracing liberal arts education and, and saying that even innovations mm -hmm. that are typical of the tradition were still representative of liberal arts. And then Koopman just uh, wrote a piece in the 1970s tracing the thread of humanism in the education in the United States. And I want to do something similar, tracing humanistic education through the innovation of the community college system as a whole. And my hope is that if I can get this dissertation completed, I might be able to turn it into a micro history for, for the public at large. Um, mm -hmm. Micro histories are much more approachable than boring dissertations um, that utilize historic discourse analysis, even though I find it fascinating, <laughs> I think the majority of other people would. But um, I think innovation is where that, that, that you, can, you can point to where you see those shifts happen. Thank you, and our final question, Betty, go ahead. I would like to know what part of the Santa Fe College program uh, is going to be moved to that, that beautiful new campus that you're building on University, and I think it's sixth. Uh, it's just a fabulous looking building 
what part of your program will be downtown? All of our business programs will be moving uh, to the Blunt Center campus, uh, as well as uh, internet technology, information technology education. Both those programs will be housed uh, at um, the new Blunt Center. And we are so very excited oh, to, uh, you know, to, to see, to have an opportunity to even better serve uh, the students on the east side of Gainesville and actually have a better connection, even better connection to the students at the University of Florida as well. Um, there's a lot of promise there. It is going to be a great, very thoughtfully constructed space. Um, we're we're excited to to finally be able to open it. It, would, it would, are we saying 2023? Is that right, Adrian? Well, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, I can tell you that we just wrote for another trio grant, which would be our sixth trio grant, um, educational opportunity center that would be housed there. And an educational opportunity center actually works with adults who did not graduate from high school and need to be brought back in to get their GED and then help them into the college from, from their GED. And so I know that would be there and that grant starts in 2022. So my assumption is that would be operational by then. And I assume we'll continue the commitment that we've had uh, at uh, the Blunt Center and at our other centers for all students to be able to, uh, if they you know, thoughtfully, you know, uh, if they kept going and, and taking classes in sequence to uh, earn all the credits needed for a general for the general education part of an AA uh, at um, the Blunt Center, and of course, you know there'll be opportunities for people to to take all the classes necessary for an AA, an AS, an AAS, a BAS, um, uh, our certificate in those business and information technology areas. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ellen, if you want to wrap it up. Yes, thank you both. It was um, a fascinating and really developed presentation. And we appreciate all the hard work you put into this. Um, um, and I just want to ex express my gratitude both to Bill and Adrian uh, for hanging in there and getting this done. It, in spite of all the other demands on their time, and believe me, they have a lot of demands on their time. So thank you both, and um, I wish you all a, uh, a good rest of the day and a good week. Well, th thank you for the opportunity too. We we both, Adrian and I, both talked about how much we learned uh, by having this opportunity. Thank you so much. I know I'm a Santa Fe graduate, so I couldn't. Have <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, stay well. Thank you for being with us. Thank Thanks you. very much.